This free presentation is brought to you by Quantum University. Hi, dear friends and cultural creatives, Bruce Lipton here. Today, I have a wonderful program on the new biology and the healthcare revolution. This is science based on the research that I did while I was teaching at the University of Wisconsin School of Medicine and later uh, doing some pioneering research on stem cells at Stanford University. From this research, uh, I published uh, several books uh, based on the new science and the new biology, but for today, this is an introduction of how we can connect the energy medicine to the conventional biology that we've read about in schools. So uh, let's start off with uh, a new understanding. And the understanding is this, that in the history of science, uh, the nature of how we look at the world was really determined by the early scientists and after the modern scientific revolution began in the late 1500s. And it was Isaac Newton who was the predominant force to shape how we would look at science. And the significance of Isaac Newton's work is this. When Isaac Newton, of course, was starting out, the church was running the world, and the knowledge of the church was that uh, the earth was the center of God's firmament and that uh, spirit and energy forces were controlling the movements of the stars and the planets and the action on earth. What well, was interesting, because at the same time, Rene Descartes' idea of a machine universe uh, was really becoming prevalent in the scientific world. And it's interesting because Descartes' work uh, really suggested that the universe was like a clock. When Isaac Newton was looking at the nature of the universe and the movement of the planets and the stars, he invoked the idea of Descartes that the universe was like a giant machine. And in calculating the movements of the machine, Isaac Newton created a new physics called calculus. And then he used that physics to create uh, a new understanding of the universe. And what he did with that math from the calculus was put in the mass of a planet, the speed of a planet, the vector of the movement of that planet, physical things about planets. That's all he put in, into the equation. And what he was able to do when he solved the equation was accurately predict the movements of the universe. Well, this is profoundly important in science because science, the hallmark of science is predictability, meaning if you know something, then you should be able to predict what will happen. Well, yes, this was the cool part of Newton's work. He accurately predicted the movements of the planets in the solar system based on his equation. And then you say, well, what was the ultimate relevance of that? And the relevance was this, is that he did not put into his equation God, spirit, invisible forces. So the significance is that when Isaac Newton put his picture of the world together, he saw the universe as a machine. And the significance is that in his data, the only thing he offered in the equation were physical characteristics of the planets and their movement. No invisible energetic characteristics. So... The science that Newton was working on was a science based on the physical material world. So the science that evolved from Newton has been called uh, scientific materialism. And scientific materialism means if you want to understand the nature of the universe and everything in it, such as uh, us, then you don't have to look for invisible forces. You just study the physical realm. So this is how science got off the ground, saying if you want to understand life and biology and health, you don't have to invoke spirit and God. All you have to do is understand the physical characters that contribute to the human body. Well, the relevance about that is when Isaac Newton's work was put into play, and it was based on Descartes' understanding of a mind-body duality, the significance was that in a Newtonian world, in a Newtonian physics, it's based on matter. And the significance is simply this, that the body is made out of matter, but the mind is energy. It's invisible forces. So in the new science of scientific materialism based on Isaac Newton, we separate the mind from the body. And when we do that, we now work with the body as a physical machine in science. But what about the mind? Well, science throws the mind out of the equation for a simple reason. It's an invisible energy force. And as far as Newtonian physics goes, it's not relevant to understanding the human body. So in the world of Newtonian science and scientific materialism, we study the body. 
without invoking the mind. And it was very helpful because, remember, science got started when uh, the church was running civilization. And to get along with the church, a detente was made between science and uh, religion, and here's how it goes. Science says we will only study the physical body and we will not go into the realm of the mind. The mind is invisible energy, spirit. So they said, good. Science, we work on the physical realm, body, and we let the church handle the mind and spirituality. So there's physics versus metaphysics. The net result was simply this. Mind and, and the invisible forces were eliminated from understanding the nature of the human body. But when we look at the human body in a Newtonian perspective, then we see the human body as a machine. It's a physical element that can be taken apart and the pieces studied. So the new biology that was coming from Isaac Newton's work is a biology that said you can understand how life works by just studying the material components. So scientists started to take the body apart. First, there was gross anatomy, where they just started to look at what you could see with your eyes only. Later, when the microscope evolved, then they discovered what is called microscopic anatomy, where you then looked at those structures like the muscles and the organs and the glands, but you now looked at them with a microscope and looked at the cells and the tissues. And then after that, a new field came in, which is called biochemistry, which then further took the machine apart down to smaller and smaller pieces. The net result is simple. We look at the body as a physical machine. And if you want to understand how a physical machine works, you take it apart, study the pieces, and when you understand how the pieces work, you can put the whole thing back together again and as a result see what is, under, what is going on in the machine. And if there's something wrong with the machine, a disease, then you could attribute that to the physical mechanical parts which you can adjust and therefore create health. Well. The final taking apart of the body really occurred in 1953, and that's when the uh, double helix image offered uh, by Watson and Crick ended the search for how biology worked. Because once the double helix was found and the DNA was found, science said, oh, now we have an understanding, an understanding of how the biology works. There's a physical thing called DNA, and the physical DNA programs the nature of the body and its behavior. So the concept of reductionism, taking a machine apart to its smallest pieces, uh, was essentially completed in 1953 when they got to the DNA and said, well, that's the smallest piece that controls biology. So we bought into the story that DNA is actually the source of our physical structure and our behavioral characteristics. This belief led to something called genetic determinism. And genetic determinism is interesting because as the name implies, genes determine the character of an individual's life. And so as illustrated in this cover of Life magazine, were you born that way, it basically was saying that not only is it our physical structure programmed by the DNA, but our emotions and our behavior are also programmed by the DNA. And I said, well, what does that mean to us as individual people on this planet when we buy that story? And the answer is this. As far as we know, we didn't pick the genes that we were born with. The science says you can't change the character of the genes that you're born with. If you want to change the character of your life, you can't do it. And then you say, well, what does that ultimately mean? And it says basically simply this, that the new science reveals that we are victims of our heredity, meaning if you inherited a cancer gene, then you can anticipate getting cancer. If you have an Alzheimer's gene, you can anticipate ending up with Alzheimer's. Significance is genes control your life and you don't control them. You had no control over them. And I say, relevance? You're a victim because you cannot control your own biology. Interesting point. Once you perceive yourself as a victim, then what do you need? A rescuer. And it's interesting because the rescuer in this case turns out to be the pharmaceutical industry who comes in and says, look, you can't control your life, but we can, and we can do it through the drugs. Well, the significance about all that is that then again, we are disempowered because we are the ones uh, that are recognizing we have no influence over our lives, but we will pay others who will give us chemistry that will control our lives. So we become victims. I said, well, is this really true? Is this actually true? And I go, well, let's make an understanding. The genes of a cell, the DNA, 
are primarily all in the nucleus of the cell. So there's an organelle, an organ inside a cell called the nucleus, which is where all the DNA is. Since the DNA is believed to control biology, then the nucleus is like the cell's brain, that the DNA in the nucleus controls the behavior and development and functions of the cell. And I say, well, is this really true? Is the nucleus the brain of the cell? Well, the relevance about that is then very simple, and it goes like this. It says that if you remove the brain from an organism, then what is the consequence of that action? What happens when you remove the brain from an organism? And the answer is straightforward and simple. It basically says that the organism dies. And so that without a brain, there's no control, and the organism dies. And I say, well, okay, let's go to a cell. And in that cell, we say the nucleus is the brain of the cell. And then I say, well, if I remove the nucleus, like removing the brain, the cell should die. And it's a process called enucleation. And enucleation uh, is where you go into the cell with a micropipette and you pull out the nucleus of the cell. So the cell has no genes in it anymore. And I say, well, what's the consequence of doing that? Does the cell die? And the answer is, absolutely not. The cell doesn't die. The cell lives and its uh, behavior is exactly the same. It's unaffected. And the cell can live for months without the DNA. I say, well, why is that relevant? And a simple point is this. Well, then the DNA is not controlling the biology of the cell. The DNA is actually a, a, a programming device but it doesn't control things. So the simple point is this. If you can remove the nucleus from the cell and the cell still has all of its intact and very complicated behavior, then by definition, the nucleus cannot be equal to the brain of the cell. And so now we're left with a very interesting challenge because we say, well, the nucleus is controlling everything in the brain and that led us to believe what? That led us to believe that DNA makes decisions and that DNA turns on and turns off. How many times have you heard in the past that uh, genes turn on, genes turn off, and genes control behavior? Well, let me give you a flat out answer about that question. The answer is, it is totally false. Genes cannot turn on, genes cannot turn off, genes control nothing. Genes are blueprints. They're exactly the same kind of blueprints that you find in an architect's office, except the blueprints of the genes make the proteins, which are the building blocks of the body. So the DNA are the blueprints to make the building blocks to make a body. The significance about that is that the DNA, just like an architect's blueprint, does not have an on and off, does not control anything. So the whole concept that a gene turned on, a gene turned off is totally false. Genes are blueprints. The question is, who's reading the blueprints and who's selecting the blueprints to be read? It's not the DNA. It's not the genes. It's not the nucleus of the cell. So all of a sudden it says, wait, the whole biology you were brought up with that genes control life turns out to be totally wrong. So Let's go into a new biology. Let's talk about something new. But we'll first give a big fact conclusion. This is an absolute fact. Genes do not control biology. That is a fact. Genes are correlated with our biology, but they don't control it. Meaning, genes may influence the outcome, but they don't make decisions. So the first thing we have to give up is the concept of genetic determinism, where genes determine our lives. The answer to that is no, they don't. So we need a new biology and a new insight to understand how cells work. So let's take the next step. In our reductionist process, we were taking biology apart until we get down to the cells. And then I say, okay, when I take the cells apart, what is a cell made out of? Well, of course, there are large molecules called DNA, nucleic acids. There are fat molecules. There are sugar molecules. But the most important molecule in making a human body are the proteins. It's the proteins that give us the character of the body because the proteins, when they assemble, are the building blocks that give us our anatomy. So proteins provide for organismal structure. So that's a given. Now, the question is, what do the, where does life come from? Ah, oh, well, that's an exciting question for this reason, because now it's time for the secret of life. And the secret of life is this. We have about 100,000 different proteins, and the proteins provide for the physical structure. But there's something else about those proteins, and that is this. 
proteins respond to environmental signals, information in the environment. And I say, well, what's the relevance of that? And I say, when a signal is complementary to a protein, the signal and the protein combine together. But when they do that, it causes the protein to change shape. So when the environmental signal is met by the protein, the protein changes its shape and it moves. I go, ah, that's the secret of life, movement, movement. If you don't move, there's not alive. And I say, yeah, but what causes movement? I say, ah, proteins, the structure of the cell can change its structure by responding to environmental signals. So life is the result of a very simple understanding, proteins influencing the activity of the cell by changing their shape. The movement, when a protein changes its shape, is used to do the work, respiration, digestion, excretion. To give you an analogy of that, I'm now showing you a, a video. It's made of the Tesla car plant in California. And the Tesla car plant is interesting because as you see in this video, there are red machines all over the place. These red machines are like proteins. Each of these red machines will actually move in response to a signal and every machine movement is precisely determined just like that of a protein. I say, well, then what happens? I say, well, watch this video. As the machines are moving, what you're seeing is they're assembling a car. They're taking all the pieces of the body and putting that body together, welding it, making an entire car. And if you look at the video very carefully, you notice there are no people in this picture that the entire manufacturing of a car is done by these machines, each with its own little tiny movement, but when you hook all the machines together in, a, in the sequence, the movements of individual proteins when collectively working together manifest a car. And so I say, well, how is this relevant to the body? I say, in the body, the proteins are like those little red machines. And the significance is when the protein movements are integrated and connected together, guess what? They create the physical parts of the body. They create the movements. They create the actions. So our biology is essentially a mechanism of proteins and that the proteins movements like assembly line people in a factory work together and then create the functions of life. Then we're left with a very interesting and simple but fundamental conclusion and that is this. A, you're made out of protein. B, Proteins respond to environmental signals that are complementary to them. And when a signal and a protein bind together, they generate behavior. So the significance is very clear in this regard, that the behavior of a biological organism is due to two things, the proteins that make it up and the signals that engage those proteins. Well, the question is, what are those signals that control our biology? In this article, which is called Deciphering the Language of the Cells by Dr. Son, he was a scientist working on the question, do electromagnetic fields influence protein movement? And of course, he found out that they did, that energy itself can activate the proteins. But it's interesting because while that article revealed that the cells respond to the energy fields, what I really want to show you is an excerpt out of the introduction. And this is when Dr. Song was talking to a conventional biochemist about his ideas about energy controlling biology. And I love the answer because this is an answer that is typical and standard of conventional allopathic medicine. Quote, as it says in this, in this picture, a prominent biochemist in a recent conversation with the author even labeled study of this type of cell-to-cell -cell communication as astrology and maintain that signals could only be carried by the substance of chemistry such as molecules and ions. Stop. What does that mean? Signals control the proteins which make life. According to conventional allopathic science, signals can only be formed by physical things, molecules and atoms and things like that, chemicals. And I go, well, why is that relevant? And I say, because that is the foundation of the pharmaceutical industry. The pharmaceutical industry makes chemicals and elements that interact with the cells as signals to try to control the function. So basically, conventional biology, still being Newtonian, says ignore the invisible energy realm and only focus on chemical drugs, and that is our chemical understanding. But the question is, 
Is this really true? And the answer was obviously not. Dr. Song's work already showed that energy fields can alter the proteins. And so the concept of materialism, which is what we have been buying into as the source of our conventional science, is ah, <laughs> not right. And the relevance for that is because there's a new physics. And this new physics is not that new, actually. This new physics called Newtonian, uh, excuse me, this new physics called quantum mechanics is replacing the fundamental understanding that was provided through Newtonian mechanics. Remember, Newton's physics was really based just on the mechanical physical realm. And what happened was, in 1925, physicists were looking into the atom, actually in 1895 is when they started, and they found that the atom, which was supposed to be the smallest physical part of the universe, was actually made of smaller things called protons, neutrons, and electrons. Well, okay, so there's just smaller particles. Yeah, but the neat part was, by 1925, the physicists found out that the electrons, protons, and neutrons are not even physical in their origin. They're energy vortices. They're the equivalent of nano tornadoes. There's nothing physical in it. An atom is actually made out of invisible forces, energy forces. And so we move from an understanding of a Newtonian universe based on matter. And in 1925, we buy into quantum mechanics, which says that at the root, matter is actually energy itself. So everything you perceive as physical is just a, a unique form of energy. Now, this becomes important because when we separated the universe into physical matter and to energy and only study the matter, we didn't discuss or consider the realm of what energy could do. But now, with quantum physics and the universe is made out of energy, then we see that energy and atoms are directly connected to each other because they're both energy fields. So energy and cells have a direct relationship with one another. I just want you to know that quantum physics does not eliminate Newtonian physics. Quantum physics is a large physics. Newtonian physics is a small physics inside. So Newtonian principles still apply, but there's an overriding bigger science called quantum physics. And it says that the universe is made out of energy. I go, okay, so what's energy? I mean, the physical things I can show you, but what's energy? And the answer is, I can't show you energy. Why? It's invisible. But I can show you what it looks like. Because if you drop a rock into a pond, the ripples that emanate from that rock where it hits the water is actually the result of energy forces shaping the water. Energy from the falling rock is translated into the water, and that energy shapes the water. The energy is a force. It shapes the water into the ripples. So the ripples are actually complementing the shape of the energy. So a simple conclusion of this is very simple fact is that energy, invisible energy waves, are like ripples on a pond. And that all around us, the entire universe is filled with energy waves. And this is the quantum universe that we talk about. Well, that means in our understanding of the atom changes. Our understanding of the conventional atom, the Newtonian atom, as illustrated in this picture right here, looks like a little solar system of marbles and ball bearings all put together and creating a, a, a little physical structure. And that was a Newtonian uh, concept, a Newtonian vision of how an atom would look, and it conformed to their expression of a physical universe. But now, let me show you what a quantum atom looks like, and here it is. Okay, there's nothing wrong with the slide. What you see is nothing. And I say, well, yes, because an atom is energy. It's not physical. You can't see it. And then, of course, there's a bunch of you out there going, yeah, but if the atoms are, uh, are energy and I can't see it, how come I can see you? And the answer then becomes very important, and this is fundamental, is that you don't physically see a human body. What you see is light bouncing off of the energy of the human body. So in other words, you can't see me in the dark. And when you turn the light on, what you're seeing is light photons bouncing off of me and then coming back towards you. So you're seeing the reflection of photons of light off of my energy body. So you see my body and go, I see that's physical. And I go, no, no, you're seeing the reflected photons, but you cannot see my body, it's invisible. It is totally uh, a quantum mechanical device made out of energy, okay? So, 
I say, well, now what about an understanding about this energy and atoms? Do, do, are, you know, we see them as particles in our concept, but what are they? And I go, well, look, in an atom, there's an equal number of protons and electrons. Protons are positive, electrons are negative. Relevant? If you have equal positive and equal negative, then the charge of an atom is totally neutral. And I go, absolutely. But as you can see in this picture, the electrons, the black dots around the nucleus, are not equally distributed. Now, there's an equal number of them in positive charges, but the distribution of the electrons around the atom is not equal. So in this particular model of an atom, notice there's an electron on the right side of the atom, and that electron has got a negative force to it. Now, the whole atom is neutral. But if I bring a voltmeter over to the right-hand side of that atom, close to the electron, the negative field will be more influential. So on one side of the atom, it will be a little bit more negative. But because it's neutral, then on the complete opposite side of the atom, it will be a little bit more positive. So the negative and positive is neutral. But there's a negative charge around the surface uh, that is more focused on one side than the other. I say, why is that relevant? So I say, well, instead of moving a, a, a voltmeter around and checking where the positive and negative charges are, recognize this, atoms spin. And if atoms spin, I can hold the voltmeter still. And as the atom spins around, sometimes it's more positive and sometimes it's more negative. And, and it would look like this. So an atom is a vortex, like a nano tornado, it's spinning. One side more positive, one side's more negative. The red is positive in my illustration, the blue is negative. As the atom is spinning, I then put a voltmeter on it. And as you can see, as the atom spins, the voltmeter sometimes is positive, sometimes negative, and the meter goes back and forth. And I say, yeah, make a printout of that action. And when you print out the action of the voltmeter needle, what you get is a wave. There's a wave of energy, positive, negative, positive, negative, positive, negative, moving across like that. So all of a sudden I go, ah, an atom is actually like dropping a rock into the pond. And when you drop the rock into the pond, you create the ripples. What are the ripples? The waves of positive and negative energy that are radiating off of this spinning vortex of energy. And I go, oh, so our perception of an atom that we've seen in the textbook is a physical unit that uh, is the little ball bearings and marbles and all that. And I say, yeah, but what does it really look like? So I say, oh, what it really looks like is that put uh, an image of the waves around it. And the waves are like the water that is running around the uh, the atom, okay? And the significance of that is that when the waves are running around the atom, it's radiating out. So an atom is like a generator sending out waves of energy. And in fact, that picture of the atom in the center of the wave, that's not even real either because that's an illusion of physicality. When you take that atom out, all of a sudden you see what, is a, what does an atom actually represent? Ripples on a pond and that the energy is coming from the center and radiating out. Everything that's made out of matter is radiating energy. As you can see in this next slide, which is an article from Scientific American, detecting individual atoms and molecules with lasers, what's really important is actually the first sentence in the subtitle, where it reads, every atom or molecule emits and absorbs light of characteristic wavelengths. What does that mean? It means every atom is giving off light. And I go, yeah, if you understand that the ripples of energy coming off of an atom include the light uh, uh, spectrum, then every atom is giving off light. Uh, and this becomes important because it's not only giving off light, it absorbs light. So every atom is interacting with the energy field, sending out energy and also responding to energy coming to it. So the significance is that every atom uh, has a unique vibrational characteristic. And in fact, if you remember chemistry from a long time ago and you look in your chemistry book, there was a spectrum of, admission, of emission and absorption. And every element in the periodic table of elements has a unique series of light bands associated with it. These are individual frequencies. And when what you recognize is this, every atom has a unique vibrational frequency as uh, expressed in what is called the emission spectrum. Uh, this is how I can tell what a star is made out of. I can't go to a star, but I can see the light that comes off of a star. Since the atoms are giving off different frequencies of light, by assessing the frequency of light from a star, you are now able to identify what that star is made out of. So we can talk about the composition of a star, and obviously we can't get there. Why? Because a star like an atom gives off light, and it's each one is a unique individual frequency.
So we have the spectrum uh, of emission. And if you look at it, it looks very interesting because it looks like this next slide. This is a slide of the uniform product code. It's a whole bunch of bars and spaces that are found uh, on any item in a store. I go, why is it relevant? Because the bars and spaces are like the emission spectrum. They're energy vibrational frequencies. So everything that's in the universe can be cataloged by its own UPC. That's how you can go to the store and every item in the store has its own unique vibration. Uh, and then that vibration is locked as a signature to that element. To give another example of it, here's an image from a, a scan of a breast. It's not a photograph of a breast, it's an energy profile of a breast. And I go, well, why is it relevant? And I said, well, you're not looking at the physical breast, you're looking at the emission of energy. Remember, every atom, and ele an element, uh, gives off a unique spectrum. So when you're looking at this breast, you're not looking at a physical breast, you're looking at the energy profile given off by a breast. Why is it relevant? Because you can see there's a cancer in there. And how can I tell there's a cancer? because the atoms and cells and molecules involved with the cancer have a different vibrational frequency than normal tissue. So by reading the energy, I can see the individual uh, cells and tissues that are making up a structure. So I'm not reading them as physical, I'm reading energy vibrations, and that's what all the new scan systems are all about. CAT scans, PET scans, NMRs, eye scans, all of these scans, thermo scans, uh, all of these scans are what? Reading energy profiles. We're moving into a range of biology that says, yes, I know there's a physical range, but we also now know that everything that's physical is energetic, and I could read the character of your body by reading the energy profile. So our understanding of how life works is a little different than you've been programmed. In this image of two atoms and in a Newtonian physics world, that these two atoms, in our conventional understanding, when they collide together, create chemistry such as this. So you see the two atoms hit, boom, and an explosion, and we have two atoms coming together, creating chemistry. I go, that is an illusion, because the whole idea is atoms are not physical particles as illustrated in this picture. Atoms are energy forges. So if I change the picture from the Newtonian version to the quantum version, then we see ripples coming off of each atom. And in fact, if we remove the, the so-called physical expression of the atom, that little solar system, out of the middle of our ripples, then what you have are like two ripples on a pond coming toward each other, and that the two energies are interacting. Atoms don't touch each other. Atoms aren't even physical. Atom energies touch each other. The energies radiating off. Remember, every atom and element gives off light of different characteristic frequencies. That's different energies. So I say, oh, so then in physics, in quantum physics, the idea of chemicals as being physical things that plug into each other, lock and key, this is totally incorrect. In quantum mechanics, it's energy waves that interact. So I say, well, what do I call the energy in the field? Ah, the field. That's what physics talks about. And they talk about the energy interacting. It's called interference. When one bunch of ripples interacts with another bunch of ripples, it's called interference. So energy can interact with energy. Remember, atoms not only give off light, they absorb light. So energy can affect the energy of an atom. So the new understanding is this. Everything is made out of energy. The invisible stuff that we're immersed in right now, all the energy around you that's in the air that you can't see, television broadcast, cell phone broadcast, radio broadcast, energy from the sun, all that invisible stuff is called the field. And we as physical bodies are actually energy bodies immersed in the field. And that this energy field interacts with our elements, our atoms, remember, because atoms not only give off energy, they absorb energy. I said, well, there's two ways that energy can interact. And that is, if I drop two rocks in a pond, I'm going to illustrate what can happen when two energies interact. I have exactly the same size rocks, exactly the same height above the water. And when I drop the two rocks into the water, the ripples from each rock are going up and down and coming toward each other. And the question is, what happens when the ripples meet? Well, what happens when the energy meets is this. As illustrated in the first slide, I have wave A on the left and wave B on the right, and they're approaching each other. I say, well, what happens when the two energies hit each other? 
I go, ah, when the energies hit each other, they interact. So first I give you a schematic version. Here are the two energies they come across, and then I show the region of overlap. And in that region of overlap, I have the wave form of one rock and the wave form of the other rock right above each other where they overlap. And I say, how do you know what the result is? And I say, you add up the values of the waves. So as you look at this, you see the red wave is plus one, the green wave is plus one, and where they overlap. I say, oh, well, then the energies activate together. And so the result of that is a wave of height plus two. And then you can see the valley in the red wave minus one one and the valley in the green wave minus one you add those together you get minus two so I say so what is the result of two energies interacting when they're in harmony with each other because they were exact same waves coming toward each other so there's two waves in harmony and they come together and I say what is the result and as you can see in version C as the waves come together the interaction leads to much higher waves than either the two smaller waves point the height of a wave is power in other words, drop a small rock into the pond, you get a little ripple. Drop a big rock into the pond, you get a big ripple. The height of the ripple is the power. So I have two small waves coming together in harmony, and when they add up, guess what they do? Increase the power. So I say, ah, oh, the waves are interfering with each other. I say, yes, but it's called constructive interference. Why? The resulting interaction leads to more power between the waves than existed when they were individual waves. So it's a positive influence, two energies coming together, getting more powerful, it's called good vibes. Meaning that if your energy and another person energy that's in harmony with you come together, your energy and their energy when they come together enhance both of your energies uh, and that's constructive interference and you can feel that as more energy in your body is called good vibes. Let me show you something that looks almost exactly the same but here's what's different about it. It's, this is not constructive interference the, the, uh, and good vibes. This is almost looking exactly the same, but I say, what's the difference? And I say, the difference in this slide, which almost looks the same, is that I drop one of the rocks before I drop the other rock. So one rock hits the water first, and then the other rock hits the water. And what's the point? The ripple on this one is going up, but the ripple on this one is going down. When this one's going down, this one's going up. Ah, the waves are not in harmony. The waves are not in phase anymore. And as they come across together, you can see what the result would be when two energies that are not in phase come together. You still add them up like before, but this time where the red ripple is at plus one, the green ripple is at minus one. Where the red ripple is at minus one, the green ripple is at plus one. I say, well, what's the issue? I say, well, you add minus one plus one, zero. Plus one minus one, zero. I say, oh, look what happens in C the version C where the two ripples are coming together, you can see they're out of phase, and then I say, what happens when they come together? Flatline. In other words, flatline is no energy. So it's an interference, it's not constructive interference, it's called destructive interference, meaning that two energies out of phase can come together and cancel each other out. So the range of energy interactions is two energies can go, they come together and enhance each other profoundly, become greater, bigger waves, or two energies out of phase when they come together can cancel each other out. And so the canceling each other out is not a good vibe, it's called bad vibes. And what does that mean? That means when you're in an energy field that is not in harmony with you, the two energies, when they come together, will cancel each other out. You lose energy. Bad vibes is, is a body reading saying that the environment that you're in is not supporting your life because energy is life. When the energy gets canceled, you're losing life. So constructive interference, good vibes, enhances your energy. You're in the right place. Bad vibes is when these two energies come together, they're destructive interference, they cancel each other out and the energy disappears and that's a loss of energy. And this is what we read in our biology about the energy. Good vibes go that way because that enhances your life. Bad vibes are your body telling you the energy in the field does not support you, don't go that way. That's a simple conclusion of what that comes from. So I say, okay, now what is the relevance of all this? And I say, okay, here's a picture of a family. It's a silhouette of a family and dog and the kids and parents. And I go, well, that's what you would see with your eyes. And I say, yeah, but what if you just read energy? What would it look like? And I say, ah, if you just read energy, it looks like this. 
And what you can see is that the energy waves are not contained in the individual. The energy waves become entangled with each other. The word entanglement means that energies come together and they interact with each other. So if you're a member of a family and you have an energy for your own life, your energy is influenced by the energy of your mother, your father, your siblings, and the community around you. Why? Because there are no walls between the energy. Everybody's energy is integrated with each other. So the significance is everything that's physical is energetic and they, everything that's energetic influences your biology. Now, interestingly enough, there's a study in uh, nature and it was a very Latin-y kind of science name called hyperconjugation, not steric repulsion, leads to the staggered structure of exaethane. <laughs> What's that? Oh, it's basically a paper saying that that when an ethane molecule uh, responds to energy, it moves and changes shape. And remember, science is based on prediction. So scientists studying the movement of the ethane molecule were trying to predict the movement using the foundation of Newtonian physics with local energy, positive and negatives interacting like that. Uh, and they were not able to predict the movement. But when they started to look at the movement using the principles of quantum mechanics, energy interactions, they were able to accurately predict the movement. And you say, well, why is that relevant? Because the movement of a molecule is the foundation of life. It is the movement of proteins that generate life. If you understand the mechanics that cause a molecule to move, then you understand the mechanics of life. And what does this new story show? Well, it shows as reviewed in this uh, uh, review of that paper by Puff, Ristick, and Goodman, and this is an article called A New Twist on Molecular Shape. Uh, this is a chemical a physis, uh, chemical physicist who was looking at the report by Profistic and Goodman and said, oh my God, uh, th this changes everything about how we look at life. Uh, and the subtitle of this article is interesting because it reads very simply this. It says, what are the forces that control the twisting and folding of molecules into complex shapes? Don't look for the answers in your organic chemistry textbook. And I say, why is that relevant? And the answer is this. Organic chemistry is the foundation of medicine. The mechanisms of organic chemistry do not match the mechanisms of how molecules change shape. Why is it relevant? Because life comes from molecules changing shape. So if you study organic chemistry, the foundation of conventional medicine, you have no insight into the nature of the forces that form life. And basically what this whole paper does but Propristic and Goodman's paper does. It says is that the basis of a materialistic science based on studying materialism is totally inaccurate in trying to understand the nature of life. So the concept of materialism, eh, that's out of here. It's all energy-based, so we move on to a new understanding of life. This article, Controlling Biological Functions, is a new insight about how proteins move. So now we're not looking at a Newtonian foundation, a mechanical nature of how they move, an energetic one. And here's an interesting paragraph right out of the uh, uh, third paragraph in the paper. It says, for a quantum mechanical object, one can arrange interference. Remember, constructive and destructive? It's one can arrange interference of several paths to create constructive interference that selects one state of the molecule and destructive interference that blocks other states of the molecule. And why is this relevant? It's talking about wave interactions controlling protein functions. So uh, the conclusion of the paper is very simple because basically what the paper concludes is this, and it says, manipulation of the quantum properties of matter can influence the course of biochemical reactions. Fundamental conclusion, quantum physics is now recognized as the primary influence of shape change in a protein, which by definition is the source of life. And all of a sudden you say, oh my God, allopathic medicine has completely ignored the entire relevance of all this energy. And it turns out that the energy science is the science that is controlling life. And so the drug industry has been preventing us from going into this area of energy medicine for a very simple reason. The drug industry sells chemicals, the basis of Newtonian materialistic science. If you could put energy into a capsule and sell it, I'm sure the pharmaceutical industry would be selling drugs right now that are energy medicine, but you can't. So since you can't sell energy, what do you think the pharmaceutical industry does? 
it suppresses all knowledge about energy healing. Why? There's no profit in it. And that is why we have a difficult time moving into the new field of energy biology. It's being held back by the pharmaceutical industry. But is this energy real? Is it really valid? Can it work? Well, here's an interesting paper. This was back, uh, a paper in 1974 by C.W.F. at at uh, Department of Biophysics at University of London. And I say, what's the relevance of this article? Resonance and bioenergetics. And basically what the article is simply coming down to and saying is this. There are two ways of signaling proteins to cause them to move. One with a physical signal, such as a chemical or drug, and one with an energy signal, such as an energy vibration. The question McClare asked is, is there a preference for biology uh, uh, units such as cells? Do they prefer the resonant energy or do they prefer the chemical energy as a form of signaling to activate the cells? So when he put it all together, what he found out was this, is that, uh, let's just read what he said. In competition, resonant molecular machines would undoubtedly be selected over conventional thermodynamic machines. Well, that sounds complicated, but let's simplify it. A resonant machine is a vibrational machine. In other words, do vibrational energies uh, given to a cell, uh, would they be selected over what is called thermodynamic machines? And I go, what's that? And I say, well, remember when you were in school and you had test tubes in a chemistry lab and you put some chemicals in and you held the tube? You could feel heat in the tube. That's called uh, thermochemical reaction. Heat is given off. And I go, well, so what's the relevance? And I say, well, here's the important part. Heat is wasted, dissipated energy. So when heat is given off, that's energy that's lost. And I go, so what's the significance? And it goes like this. Physical chemical signals lose 98% of their energy as wasted heat. So somewhere between 1% and 2% of the available energy as a signal is offered as a signal, and 98% or more of the energy is wasted as heat. So a chemical signal is only carrying about 1% of information to, uh, available to it. I say, what about resonant vibrational energy? I say, oh, no heat loss. What does that mean? Ah, then all of the energy in a vibration signature is available for communication. So if you understand what's going on, then basically it says this, is that only 1% of the energy of a chemical signal is available as signaling. And 98 to 99% of the energy in a resonant vibrational signal is available for signaling. Simple conclusion an energy signal is 100 times more efficient in signaling biological molecules than our physical chemical drug signals. And the energy signal is going at 186,000 miles per second compared to a chemical signal, which is diffusing slowly through the fluid. So even if it went a foot in a second, compare that to the energy signal that's going 186,000 miles. What's the conclusion? Energy signals are 100 times more efficient and infinitely faster. So what is the net result uh, McClare comes to? He says, we must conclude there is another level of organization in biological systems, a tuned resonance in different molecules that enables bioenergetic machines to operate rapidly yet efficiently. And all of a sudden it says, new science, quantum mechanics, if you give an energy signal, uh, versus a chemical signal, the difference is the energy signal is 100 times more efficient, infinitely faster, and would be chosen by biology over chemical signals. And it's interesting because the energy signals of wood have been left out of the material science of a, a Newtonian biology. So we're really moving on. So what does it say we have here now? The result is simple. Signal plus protein equals behavior. The signals come from the environment. The conventional understanding is that signal is based on chemistry. But the new understanding is no, energy signals are not only available, but they'd be chosen over chemical signals. So there's an energy communication. It used to be referred to before science even understood it in the early days, this invisible energy that controls life was called a vital force. That vital force is now understood in quantum mechanics as vibrational energy signals. 
that influenced the biology. And, and now it's coming back in because a vital force was thrown out as being metaphysical. But now it's coming back in. And I say, well, why should it come back in? What happened to metaphysics and energy? And here, here's a simple point, is that when we were talking about the physical realm only, which is Newtonian science, then all signals had to be in a chemical form. But now that we understand the nature of quantum mechanics and the efficiency of the energy signals, what was left out of biology as metaphysics has now come into the field as quantum physics. A simple point. What is the invisible energy called in quantum physics? It's called the field. I say, oh, what's the definition of the word the field? Oh, field, invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. I go, wow. It's the same definition of what? Spirit. Invisible moving forces that influence the physical world. Metaphysics, spirit was thrown out of biology back in the 1700s. Guess what? It's now back in the form of quantum mechanics. Why? Field and spirit share the same definition. You want to be scientific? You call that invisible energy field. You want to be spiritual? It's called spirit. Hey, they're both the same. So invisible forces are indeed influencing our lives. But now we also know that the invisible forces are the primary communication over the chemical forces which are not as efficient. So this leads us to a new understanding about the role of energy and healing. And when we talk about energy and healing, we have to recognize energy, when we use that term, actually applies to two different things. It's almost like apples and oranges. Energy can be referred to as a force or energy can be referred to as information. And the interesting part about it is energy as force has been studied by the medical, the allopathic profession. They study it as called ionizing energy, energy that destroys matter, such as x-rays, UV light, cosmic radiation. That's the only energy that physical scientists, Newtonian scientists look at in regard to life because that energy destroys matter. What they've ignored is that energy could be information. Energy can not be a force, but change signaling. So signaling versus force is different. And so when we look at energy as information, this is the whole foundation of complementary medicine. Complementary medicine implies that we're working with energy fields. And now it becomes important to medicine, stop trying to look for energy signals as a force. But now medicine must start to look at energy signals as information. And that means that you would look at it in a different fashion than the old days. Yeah, crank up the energy. It's not going to physically change the cell and destroy it like UV light. It's, you use a low vibrational frequency and the cells respond to subtle energies. In fact, if you blast the energy too much, the cell ignores the signal as being an artifact. That these signals that are sent by the cells are almost just at the level of our ability to read them in the scientific world. They're so low energies and they're so involved. And now you under, come to an understanding, so how does this energy affect biology? Well, the energy that affects biology is very simple. The energy affects proteins, and the proteins change their shape. The significance is when a protein changes its shape, it moves, and that movement is used to create life. And now what we know is a very simple, important fact, that the genes, the DNA in the nucleus of the cell is not responding on its own. It's responding to the information in the environment, the energy in the environment. And that energy that's coming from the environment is either direct energy from the environment, like energy fields in which we live, but also, more importantly, recognize this, that the mind is a generator of energy fields. You can read the energy of the mind. You can put EEG wires, electroencephalograph wires on a person's head and read the energy broadcast coming from a brain. But an even newer technology is called not electrical uh, encephalograph, electroencephalograph. It's called magnetoencephalograph. I say, well, encephalograph means brain, reading brain function. Uh, magneto means instead of reading the electric field of a brain, how about reading the magnetic field? Because the electric and magnetic fields are connected. Relevance, this is really critical, is that the magnetic uh, encephalograph, MEG, the probe does not touch the head. The probe is outside. And I say, well, what's the relevance of the probe being outside? And the answer is this. 
your thoughts are not contained in your head. Your thoughts are broadcast as an energy field. The broadcast of the energy field of the mind is a source that controls the biology. And all of a sudden you say, wait, I thought chemistry and all that controls biology. I don't know. Thoughts are the primary control of biology and the energy fields around those thoughts. And if our energy fields are off, then our thoughts are off and that changes our biology. It's the foundation of what we call the placebo effect. What is the placebo effect? Oh, I believe this pill is what's going to cure my illness and the doctor told me and I believe it so much and I take the pill with the belief and guess what? I get healed only to find out that the pill was a sugar pill. So what healed me? It was not the physical nature of the pill. It was the thought of the pill. The thought in my head generates a healing energy field, which is now affecting my cells. And this becomes really very critical for us to understand for a simple reason. Conventional allopathic medicine ignores the entire energy spectrum in regard to our biology, except for those uh, ionizing energies that destroy life. All the energy of other fields are ignored. And this turns out to be totally incorrect. That the work that you are doing, uh, especially at IQIM, uh, the work is so critical is to move out of a vision of a physical mechanical universe and start to recognize that energy influences are actually altering the biology directly because energy signals cause proteins to change shape and proteins changing shape as a source of life. So we left with a very important conclusion. The focus on drugs chemistry and physical manipulation of the body is a, a misperception. It's a misdirection. You want to influence the body most effectively, you do it through energy healing. And you can introduce energy into the body, hands-on energy healing. As I talked about, energy waves interact. Remember, all atoms and molecules give off light and absorb light. If I'm a patient, I'm an energy field, and if you are an energy healer, you're another energy field. And remember, energy fields can come together and they can entangle. And that's called constructive and destructive interference. And so by adding energy into my body, I can control my genetics, my behavior, and my biological expression through entanglement. So an energy healer entangles with their patient and helps bring in the correct energy field to bring health and harmony back to the body. And that is the mission of an energy healer. That is the understanding that there is a science, that this energy is not invisible to the body. The body is energy and directly responds to that energy. So the work that you're doing at this university is the work of the future. It is the work to show that we can bring in energy and alter the health of an individual. And a very exciting part about that, just a little, a little add-on to make energy healing so valuable, is there are no side effects. In other words, energy healing will not damage the system. And so look at where you are. IQAM is a great place to learn a new understanding of health and a new way of controlling biology on this planet. And there you are now at the leading edge and I really hope that this information on how the field affects proteins uh, becomes a great contribution to your studies in regard to how energy controls life. Thank you for listening. Join the quantum medicine movement. Speak with an admission advisor today.